this Orit from the Core Ceph team. Talk a little bit about our uh, object storage, the Rados Gateway in Ceph. So. Hello. Thank you for coming so early on Sunday. I know it's hard. <laughs> uh, I'm Orit. I'm part of the Ceph team in Red Hat, and I work on cloud object storage in Ceph. And today we're going to explain what, what cloud object storage is, how different regular storage types, a little bit about Ceph. So first, who uses Ceph? Not much. We need more hands. So we explain what Ceph is, how it's built, and then we talk about what is Gateway, who is the part of Ceph that provides cloud object storage interface. And hopefully we have time for a few questions. So in general, I prefer people to ask questions during the presentation. So if someone needs a question, just raise your hand. So let's start, what is this cloud object storage? So we have uh, block storage. Anybody uses block storage? Yeah, of course, we all do. So storage is divided into those fixed blocks depending on the device. Uh, we don't have any metadata related to the data. You just write the data somewhere in device offset level. And the application need to manage to know what exactly it's written there. Where it's written, you can have several devices. But it's really fast. Well, for storage. And today we registered it, it's really fast. You have the regular protocol, fiber channel, SCSI, SATA, uh, iSCSI, and some people even use fiber channel over internet. But that, using a block storage is really hard for applications. So then came file systems. So here the data is organized. We have hierarchy of directories that can correct contain files and other directories. We have users. We have metadata for this data. The file can be in any place. You can overwrite it in the middle and allocate on demand. It's much easier for the application to use the storage, but it's slower than block. There's lots of arguments sometimes with file system people, but it's slower. Uh, because of the old metadata and your key handling. You, several, not all file systems, but many have sharing semantics, so you actually can log the file for uh, read only or completely for you, and two different applications can use and write to the same file in the same time. We have local file system protocol like XC4, XFS, and so on. And we also have network file protocol like NFS and SMB. And FP is the Apple protocol by the class they <laughs> decided not to use it anymore and they're moving for, to SMB. But then came something new. It was the cloud. So we had the problem before the cloud came. We saw the storage is growing and growing. So people move to more distributed storage systems. And writing a distributed file system is really hard. <laughs> I don't know if many of you have tried. Writing a regular file system is hard, but when you try to distribute it, the metadata you need to sync it all around is a problem, and the RFP is a problem. The last of people you can <laughs> say, agree. <laughs> But in the cloud, it became even harder because we're not only talking about a large amount of data that is accessed all around, but we're talking also a large, really big data chunks. And then came one company, and then came the object storage that existed before the cloud object storage, but it was mostly like a niche, I guess, and. I did research stuff on object storage, but it wasn't used uh, the other standard. But nobody used it. But then came Amazon, actually. 
And when they fired their own object storage, it caught up. I remember it was something like, I guess, 10 years ago when S3 was launched. And I thought, wow, this is the way to do storage. How can it be? I thought it really is amazing as a storage person. I then was then in IBM research and actually said, no, we need to do something like that in IBM. But of course, IBM is not good at being innovated and they never did anything like that. So the idea is very simple. One, we're talking about cloud environment. So you want the API to be really for cloud. So that means it should be HTTP based, so that's REST API. And you want some of the amazing of the data that the complex IRF flight systems have is really hard. So it's just two levels. You have these Amazon call them buckets, uh, Swift called them containers, we have pools. So just a container of object is the way to organize your object into groups and maybe add some properties for that. So that's bucket and inside the bucket you have those uh, objects. And objects are not just data, you, you they have a name, you can add them all sort of metadata. Some are fixed and some you can decide on your own. So you can let, let them find them and know what's the data in them. You have users and tenants, which is like an umbrella for users to share the same data between them. You have authentication, ownership, access control list. And you talk about large objects, really large. So that means you need lots of storage. Because there's a large object, usually objects are immutable. That means you write them once, if you decide to change them, you need to actually overwrite all the objects. You cannot write in between. And it's much more efficient for those large objects to be immutable and it simplifies the allocation. So the protocols today, the most common one is Amazon S3. It's the richest one. And I don't know what scale Amazon is, but I'm sure it's huge. I cannot imagine how much storage S3 has. In OpenStack, we have Swift, and there's also Google Cloud Storage. So this is the example of how the API looks. Uh, put, write an object, get, Ah, this is a bucket. So put, create an, create an object, a uh, bucket, get, uh, read the bucket. Uh, you have actually, it can be more complex because you can read also the data that are using head. You can delete a bucket, uh, create an object. But it's not a simple act of copy operation. This is actually a simplification because as you see, there's some headers here. Usually there's lots of data that says all sorts of metadata or maybe make the operation more complex. So we talked about really large objects. Anyone here ever downloaded stuff from the internet and you lost connection and you need to restart the download? Everybody, it's really annoying. And when we talked about large objects, we can get to giga size. So this is, can be really hard. So for that, we have the multi-part. You want to da upload or download an object, but you want to maybe stop it, maybe retry. So you take a big object, you divide it to small parts, and each part is being uploaded or downloaded in parallel, so you can handle network problems, and then only you need, you can continue where you stopped, and you can stop, start, upload, download, and also it's good for streaming, for example, when you don't know the size of the objects you're actually going to upload or download. You, download usually knows, but upload, you sometimes generate the data when you upload it, and for that you use multipath. But it's, it's harder for the storage because until you finish your upload, you don't know what the object 
will be and we cannot commit it, so we need to start on those temporary parts. And sometimes you will have failure and we start the upload completely again, so we need to buy in the background to clean all the extra stuff we got. Another feature which I really like. So here, whoever used here VMS? Oh, no one. Yeah. So remember VMS? We had a file version in. When you write on the file, you get a dot something. I really liked it because I sometimes do by mistake delete stuff. <laughs> it's really good. You always have the previous copy. So again, in cloud storage, we have versioning. By default, buckets, it's per bucket. By default, buckets are not with versioning, but you can enable it. And that's mean when you override the object, it creates a new object with a different version. If you delete the latest, you will still have the old version. It's really helpful when you delete stuff by mistake or override by mistake an object. And cloud objects as other really, really cool stuff. Um, I didn't talk here about authentication because every protocol does it completely different. Uh, the main difference between Google Cloud Storage and S3 is authentication and it's incompatible. Uh, Swift does it differently. So some use user passwords, some use, use user and a secret, a key and a secret. Everything is really different. So authentication is complex. And we have uh, object life cycle. For example, you can set a date in the object and when it gets to that date, it's called object expiration, the object can be deleted automatically or moved to cold storage. And lots of cool features. Any question about cloud storage? So let's talk about Ceph. So Ceph is shortcut for Cephalopod, which is the family of octopuses and squid. Uh, so all our version are called of uh, one animal, that name. So the latest stable version is Joe. I think that one is Joe, <laughs> if I remember. So Ceph is open source. This is the our GitHub. We have Ceph org. Under it is all the Ceph code. It's not only Ceph. We have our own testing framework called Tautology. It's also open. And we have additional tests, like we have S3 tests, that test S3 compatibility. Uh, we have other components of Ceph. <coughs> so Ceph is open source. We are in first them. So it's open source, LDPL. It's software defined storage Well, We are in the software defined storage world. That means it can run on many kind of platforms. Yeah. You can configure and adapt it to different topologies and scale. It's distributed system and like a say <laughs> distributed system, it doesn't have any single point of failure. When you have a large number of nodes, you cannot handle a single point of failure. You, because you assume everything will fail. Large scale means failure happens. It's massively scalable. It was built to be large scale. So we say POC can be three nodes, but the minimum is five. And I actually recommend more. It's, it's a large scale system not for two nodes, three nodes. Because we are large scale, we assume that we error, we have to rep either replicate data or use the res recording to be more efficient space, because we assume the data get lost, so we need more copies. It's a large system, failures happen, so we want self-healing because you cannot handle those failures Manually, everything should happen automatically. And we have unified access. So we have uh, CFFS, as the name, it's the file system access. It's a project compliant file system. You can use uh, our client, Fuse, or uh, 
our kernel client and there's integration to OpenStack Manila. And you can use NFS Ganesha with it for NFS and Samba for SMB. RDB is the block interface. Many know it from OpenStack. It's integrated completely with QMU. So you can use it with QMU for Zen or QMU for KVM. And you can use a kernel client if you want your own block device. And we have Rogers Gateway, which is a component that provides a cloud object storage. Underneath this all, we have Redis. And I'm going to speak a bit about Redis. So Redis is a reliable autonomous distributed object storage. So as we see, it's an object storage, which is <laughs> interesting. So when Seth started, it was, well, the f it was to build a very fast, scalable, distributed file system. And they started with Redis to be as the rich object storage that you can build the file system on it. Easier, oh, at least. Uh, but writing distributed file system is never simple, even if you have distributed object storage underneath. And in the meantime, it took to develop CFFS, the started RBD, and made a gateway. And now we also have CFFS as production. So what, is that, what Redis does, it does all the distributed stuff. So it does all the replication and all the register coding. It's a flight object name sense, and we call, we have a pool of object, and it, we can configure each pool. It could be a pool of very of fast storage, SSDs, or a pool of slow storage with a hard disk. Uh, it could be different application, it could be freeways, or it could be razor codes. Ceph is strongly consistent system. And it's software defined, that means it's is a web to the infrastructure and the topology and you can match it to different architectures and systems. For placement, we have a hash based algorithm with no lookup called crash. And we want performance, so we serve the data directly to the client. So a little bit about Crash. Crash is our placement algorithm. And we wanted an algorithm because it's a last case system that doesn't require any lookup. Lookup requires some central area. You keep the table of the lookup. You can replicate it, but it's not very efficient in large scale. It's a bottleneck. So Crash doesn't require any lookup. It is topology aware. So that's mean you can actually put in, you uh, can say this is a REC, and I want, don't want to place two copies on the same REC. So you choose nodes that are not on the same REC. You can configure the application, you can do rates, and it's really fast calculation, deterministic, and it's evenly distributed. That's why we call it pseudo random because that way we can benefit from all nodes. So a Ceph Radius cluster has two kinds of node. The first one, OSD, object storage device. Those, we have lots of those nodes, demons, uh, tens to ten thousands. I think ten thousands a lot, maybe thousands. <laughs> and we have one OSD per disk. You can put an OSD on a RAID, but it's a bit a waste because we do the application ourselves. There's no reason to do additional replication in the storage layer. And its main thing it does is serve the object to the user. It's a smart storage node. That means it does peering, and in case of a failure, it does the recovery automatically. The always these are talking with each other and will replicate the needed data. Or if a new node comes, it will rebalance the storage. <coughs> then 
the other color of nodes we have is the monitor nodes. They serve the, all the clustering logic. They maintain the cluster membership. So if a node defaults, the monitors get a notification because it's clear we notice that the OSD is not responding and it will notify the monitor there's a failure and then the monitor will spread it to the other OSDs. And when we add an OSD in the same way, we have a small odd number of those nodes, three, five, and so on. They do use Paxos. It doesn't stop any data to the users, it's just for the cluster memberships data. So we have this cool object storage cluster. We want to access it. So we, there's libredis, and you actually can use libredis if you want. You have your own application, and it really needs lots of performance, and you're willing to actually in, interact with the Redis API directly, and you can use, we have actually some users who use libredis directly. It has binding to C++, C, Go, Ruby, Python, I don't remember, probably more. And it's a very rich API. It's not just read, write, object. You have a key value store, we call it OMAP. So inside one object, you have a key value store, and you can use this to store, for example, the file system stores the directory is in an OMAP, a Redis gateway, the bucket index is the OMAP. It su supports atomic single object operations, so you can update the attributes and keys and data on a sing in an object in one operation. It has snapshots per object. It's object immutable, that means you can actually partially overwrite object. And we have Redis clusters are very similar to storage procedures on a database. You can actually write code that will run directly on the OSD when an object is changed. It's a really strong feature. It allows lots of performance. We use it uh, all around the services. And we have a watch notify service so you can uh, register an object and when the object changes, we get a notification across the cluster. Everyone registers the notification. So they, it's a very strong API, but it's not a standard API. It's not block interface, file, or object, a cloud object. It's your own. And if you really import the performance and you're willing to make the effort, the brightest will be really good. Cool. Any question about Ceph in Java? Yeah. Uh, just a few words about Ceph. What's the approach you use? Okay. So first, uh, all these are divided into placement groups. So an OSD, all OSD need to replicate one another. One can be uh, <coughs> the master in some case. In some other case, it's just be a replica. So they talk with each other and they can detect when there's a failure because they need to talk with each other and then if they get an error, they, they, they notify the monitors and then the cluster starts to under that case. So you need that OSD that failed. It's taken a while to, to mark it as failed, but when it's failed, you know all the data it contains and uh, need to be replicated to other OSDs. So then they do it automatically. Well, depending on the size of the object, but uh, our maximum size of object in the Redis is 4 mega, so 4 mega will be, it, let's say you have three OS replicas, so three OSD will have those 4 mega. If the object is larger, then it's more complicated. Uh, I'm sorry, my question is, is the object distributed? 
storage nodes to have to retrieve the completed object? No, no. Besides, no. You need just one. Yeah, you need one to read. Yeah. To write, you need three, let's say. Or to, if it's three ways, you need three copies. We write three times, but we, you read, you would need one copy. Yes? Many lower, if that's the divide, of course we prefer many high quality. <laughs> yeah, but the more you have machines, the more you can do large scale. Now we're going to Redis talk about more about Redis Gateway, which is the component in Ceph that provides the cloud order storage. So like all the components of Ceph, Redis Gateway uses LibRedis to communicate with the Redis cluster. So we have this cluster of OSDs and monitors, and that's where the data is stored. And Redis Gateway is a service built on top of that. So Redis is object storage. So that's cool, it should be simple. We can have cloud object storage. But life is never simple. So it's not just to provide the REST API uh, and matching the, the API we have. When we look at our object for Redis and Redis Gateway, or cloud, we see some difference. So first Redis, the biggest size of an object is four mega, and we're talking about cloud, so we talk about really large objects. So we'll need some way of taking big objects and divide them to those four mega size objects. Uh, so Redis objects are mutable, but in cloud we talk about immutable objects. The hardest part is that the pools inside of Redis are not indexed, but users want to list all the objects in the bucket sorted by name. That means we'll need to add some indexing for the bucket to allow this listing. And Redis says per pool SEL, so pool is like a bucket, but we need SELs per object. So even in spite of the fact that Redis is object, we still need to add a layer to implement the cloud of the search at top of it. So so we have the Redis cluster. We, we save all the data inside the Redis cluster. Redis gateway is stateless. So in case you see that you have lots of actions and operation and the Redis gateway is loaded, you can just run another instance of Redis gateway on the same set cluster and both can work together and continue. And th that way you can scale up. So again, this is object storage. We have users and tenants. We have buckets, object. We have metadata per bucket per object. We have access control list per bucket per object. We have authentication, which is really complex because we support several protocols. Today we support two of cloud objects protocol, S3 and Swift. In many cases, you can use both in the same time, but sadly they are not compatible, so there are cases that it won't work. You cannot upload multi-part with Swift and read it with mass fee because they sign differently, uh, they calculate the signature differently. Uh, version is very different, you cannot use both version, version bucket from S3 will not be version when you access it from Swift and the other way. Uh, the indication of course is very different, but we do support Keystone for S3, so that's maybe okay. We also support NFS. When you say, but NFS is a file protocol. Yes, it is. It's not a full NFS. If your main workload is a file system, the CFS, 
Uh, it's for users that mostly use object storage and they can use the NFS. Uh, we use NFS Ganesha on top of uh, we call it a library, we call it lib IGW to allow that. And it's for migrating from NFS to object storage or exporting a bit. And also if you have one, this legacy application that needs this NFS, very basic stuff, then you can use it. But for full-scale NFS, you use FFS or other NFS stuff. So we try to build Redis Gateway as layered as possible. So a request goes through all the layer, one after the other. We have two layers, that two, three parts that are everyone can access uh, all the time. I'll go a bit about those. So first we have the front end. Front end is what provides the REST API actually. So it uh, has to, we need HTTP. So we have two ways. The first is the old and unrecommended way. <laughs> so we support fast DJI with Apache and probably other web servers. Uh, the reason it's not recommended is because fast CGI has lots of security issues. So, but some, sometimes in, if you already have your own Apache and you handle the security issue with fast CGI, it can be an option. Today we have also from Hammer, Pyfla actually maybe, I don't remember. We have Civit Web, uh, it's an embedded web server inside of the Redis Gateway. Uh, so we recommend that. We then we get to the rest layer. It's actually the layer that converts from past the dialect between the protocols, so it passes S3, Swift, and other API. Then it goes to execution layer, which is the common layer for all protocols. We don't want to write code twice, so we try to use as much as common code handling different protocols. The next layer is the layer that talks to Redis. It's not enough to use LibRedis. We need to do some stuff on our own. So for example, oh, I need to get faster. <laughs> we do the object striping, uh, atomic overrides, and all the bucket index handling. And we also, the, it contains the object classes that run on LST. We have quota, and we, under, we have quota per user, quota per bucket. We have the authentication layer because in many cases, in many layers, you will need to, sometimes you need to authenticate again. So we support uh, AWS V, AWS 4, Keystone 2, Keystone V3, uh, LDAP. Is what going on on STS, but hopefully it will be in the end of Kafka or maybe in Luminous. Objects are large, so we don't delete them and free the space immediately because it takes time. So it, they move to a garbage collection and in the background there's a process that clean the large objects. So I don't have time, so I'm going to skip some slides. Okay, so. Okay, so this is how we build object. We, have, we take an object, we have a head object and tail. He, all objects have a head object. It contains all the object metadata and attributes and up to 15, 512Ks of data. So small objects only have an head. A large objects are stripe and they have several tail objects. Uh, to, uh, to have a fast access to objects, objects are names inside of it. This looks something like that. Uh, so the head, the number 123 is the bucket ID. It's not the name because bucket, you can rename bucket, so it's a unique ID for bucket. And then the object name, that means that we don't need to do any lookup in order to read the head because it contains the metadata and we want Many cases want to read the metadata fast. And then the tail is the bucket ID and then some 
UUID and depart. A little bit of bucket index. So it's bucket index is just all the objects in the bucket sorted by name. But when we talk about cloud object storage, we have cases that one bucket contains millions of objects. And then the bucket index is also a bottleneck for performance and also because it's in the end stored in an order, the other subject, uh, if we pass one object line, it's also inefficient. So first thing, if you have lots of lots of objects, the self number is up to whatever k object per the one bucket in this, that's fine. If you have one, more than one under case, then you need to use sharding. We take the bucket index and split it to several objects. Uh, depending on the number of objects, you decide what number of shards you want. We have now support for offline resharding. So in case you didn't reshard the bucket and suddenly you got to a large number of, of objects, you can reshard it. Um, it's, I think it, it's even in Hammer, the latest Hammer, the 10, and it's in, will be in June, and there's newer versions. And we're trying to work on the online resharding that allow, you will need to offline the bucket and stop IO to it, you can do it with IO. Skip that. Okay, good. So our quota is we are distributed system. Object can be written from many many places, several other gateways. We need some way to coordinate the quota, so we use the Redis object class objects to do that. So when we actually write the object in the OSD, we update the quota. That means the quota is not completely consistent. We sometimes miss a bit, but I think file systems have the same issue with that. We have a metadata cache, and we use watch notify to under that. That means we, in case the metadata change, the other Redis gateway get a notification and then can invalidate that, that entry from the cache. So we're talking about cloud, but cloud is never one data center. Many times we want several data centers <coughs> and you want to have either disaster recovery or actually want to use all of them. For that we have multi-site algorithm application. So you can take two set clusters and you can need to configure them and there will be an asynchronous application on what each other. It could be active active or passive active. Uh, the metadata operation, which is user creation, user deletion, bucket creation, bucket deletion, and a few bucket metadata operations are asynchronous because they are really important stuff and we cannot have a difference in those. So we have a um, meta master and in case he fails, you need to do failover and configure a new MetaBuster. But the data is completely asynchronous. That means all different set class, in different cluster, you can update the object and they will be replicated automatis, automatically to the other clusters. A zone is like what we call a self cluster. So if you have two locations, each one will have a self cluster that will be two zones. A zone group is just a group of zone, of zone that has share the same data. So even then, not in the same location, they will be in the same zone group because they replicate from each one each other. Uh, we have all multi-site support in Hammer. It's called the sync agent. It's only active passive. But from June, everything is active active. I don't have time. Okay, more stuff. So we have, um, we talk about object lifecycle. We don't support the full S3 object lifecycle. We have object operation and basic uh, storage policy, which means where the after the object expired, 
to move it to a different cold storage. We support object, we have more efficient object copy operation. We don't actually copy the data, but just update the object head to point. So we know it's, it points to the same data as a different object. We have a crucial encryption, thanks to Mirantis. So all objects are encrypted. We have compassion, also Mirantis work. We support torrents. Uh, we have static website, so anyone wants to use static website. We have support, but that's new in Kaufman, uh, it's not detected you. We have metadata search, you can do export the data to Elasticsearch, and that way the user can search the metadata. And we're working about doing online bucket resharding. I hope I have time to questions. No. Okay, questions. One. Yes. Uh, is there or maybe what is the internal setup for this uh, Radus gateway rather than the Radus Well, you ask what's the performance penalty of using Radus gateway and not Radus directly. So you need to understand they are very different. Radius is REST API. So REST API is HTTP. That's slow. It's a slow protocol HTTP. So I think that's the main performance penalty. But if you're talking now about really, really large objects, then I think the HTTP the, uh, is limited. We have some of the head. We are not as wide as bench because we have the object also X attribute objects, not just an object. So I don't know the numbers, but there's apparently. Thank you.